Be seated. House stands resumed post the luncheon period. I believe at the time of taking the suspension, we were at question number 18. But I am not seeing the Honorable Senator Bruce. Yes, all right, very well. You last the questions, yes. Honorable Member. Thank you, Madam yes. Speaker, Honorable Members. I, I will uh, pose the questions on behalf of the Honorable Senator Bruce. Yes. Um, with your permission, of course. Yes. Question 18, Madam Speaker, in the, written in the name of the Honorable Senator Israel Bruce, to ask of the Honorable Minister of Transport, Works, Lands, and Physical Planning. That road leading from the residence of Lillian Bob in Mount Grennan and going all the way up to the residence of Mr. Winston Delplesh. And as you move further in the same area from the late Bethel Bob's residence across to Silver and Samuel's Gate is in need of repairs. One, can the Honorable Minister please give an undertaking to have some assessment done with regards to this portion of the road, of the road state? If yes, two, will the Minister please indicate how soon this can be done? And will he give an undertaking to submit such an, an assessment in its written form to this honorable house? Yes. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, when I saw this question, I was reminded of Oliver Goldsmith's novel, She Stoops to Conquer. And Marlowe, the character, and the play was looking, looking for somewhere to find. And the, the, the descriptions given, Hither and Thing and Lillian Road and Mary and Jonathan, across, down below by Elizabeth, down by the deep hole. This is what this one sounds like. This is really asked in a manner to impress the residents in that area in... Um, in Mongolian, you know, the, this, this really is a footpath and drains. There was an original cost, which was put at just over 30 something thousand dollars, 33 thousand dollars. The, but there's some, it's gonna cost more than that. And because there's been some deterioration since. And originally it was listed to be done as a paved project, but it didn't get done under that. And we have asked for further, for an ad additional assessment to see if we can put it under one of the, the existing ro road programs. It's, if, if not under the, the National Roads Program, Maybe one of those which Bragsa can do because it's not, a, it's not a significant sum of money. But I, I know the road too. 
um, and I will I will talk to to the, to Ken Battle, Ms. Braxa, about this. B. And I will. The Saboto was on my case. Sorry, the Honourable Minister of <laughs> Agriculture, the Parliamentary Representative for the area, was on my case about this particular piece of road too, so that there is cross-party support that we need to do this piece. It's not a big piece, but it's inconvenient to the residents who are in that immediate vicinity, like in several other places. So I, I, will, I will follow up um, and ask Kem Bartholomew. Mean, in fact, this evening when Parliament is finished, I will call him and ask him if he can um, look at this piece for us. Take it from his usual subvention. And, and um, I'm sorry that Honorable Senator Bruce isn't here, but that would be my answer to him. Yes. Question number 19. Yes. Member for Thank you, Madam Kingston. Speaker. Kingston. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Question 19, I rise to ask on behalf of the Honorable Senator Israel Bruce of the Honorable Minister of Transport, Works, Lands, and Physical Planning. Uh, the 2023 budget of St. Vincent and the Grenadines proposes to hand Vincentians a revolution in road repairs. The road leading from Kennel Gate in, into Hadley's village is crying out for some attention for the longest while now, to the point that minibus operators are refusing to service the villagers. One, will the Honorable Minister please look into his allocations for the fiscal year 2023 and kindly find some funds that would go towards the urgent repairs of the Hadley's Village main road. And two, can the people of Hadley's Village be given an undertaking that they can have their main road fixed by at least the third quarter of 2023? Yes. Honorable Prime Minister. Yes, I, I know that road and um, the Honorable Senator Bruce and so too the parliamentary representative, the Honorable Sabota Caesar, have been on the minister about this particular piece and also the, the, the representative has been talking to the, to the chief engineer. And the road needs to be done and it's a, it's a significant community. Unfortunately, in relation to the national road rehabilitation program for, for, for this year. That, that one is not, that one is not done on, on, um, on the list to be done out of that. So we'd have to find another source in the program, in, a, in, a, in the additional program to, to deal with it. It has to be, it needs to be properly assessed, no question about that. Um, but I, 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 I think we need to get, get it done before the end of this year. Uh, if, we, if we can get it done, assessed in the early part and at the same time, see how we can source some resources, but that's a significant community. And, uh, you know, there's a the road network as a whole, you know, and we have to be just honest and straightforward about this. If we, if you even take the whole budget, you can't do all the roads then. And I, I repeat, we have about close to 100 miles of highway, which are in pretty good condition. We have a uh, about 400 miles of secondary roads and a similar number of miles of um, feeder roads. And about half of the feeder roads need attention of one kind or another. And at least 25% by the estimate of the secondary roads. And, and, and in we have done some roads in that constituency, but that one has not yet um, been done. And we need, we need to 
this year we could handle that one. And that's, that's how I would answer in, in the most honest and straightforward of ways. Question number 20. Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. I rise on behalf of the Honorable Senator Bruce again to ask question 20 of the Honorable Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development, and Culture. The windward side of the country can do well with an influx of tourist dollars. The pavement, pool, and recreation site in the Greggs Mountain, Tiburu, has great potential for development as a tourist attraction with income earning capacity and employment creation opportunities. One, has the ministry ever given any consideration of this potential site for tourism investment and development, which will create employment for our young people in the Greggs, Lauders, and Lomans areas? Two, if not, will the Honorable Minister please give a commitment to lend some considerations to this potential tourism site as part of the diversification of tourism destinations on the windward side of the country? And three, if yes, could the minister undertake to embark on feasibility and environmental impact assessment studies of this area as a potential tourism destination in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Yes, Honorable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And then In the interest of time, I'll do a very detailed question I can answer in the affirmative to all of the points being raised by the Honorable Senator. But I just want to briefly just put into context how the ministry does its work in terms of product development. Um, even before this question came to the Honorable House, the Honorable Member for South Central, Winwood, the Honorable Saboto Caesar has had discussions about some of the sites, in fact, in his constituency, which he has asked us to look at in terms of developing. And this, in fact, was one of the such proposed sites. In the coming months, Madam Speaker, we intend to place a greater focus on community tourism. The ministry's plans and initiatives would serve to fully exploit community-based tourism's tremendous potential for supporting local businesses, fostering new entrepreneurship opportunities, and moreover, be beneficial for the overall socioeconomic development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Through partnership with emerging and existing stakeholders, we aim to strengthen the overall capacity of technical assistance, product development, in areas in particular, Madam Speaker, where we can see a lot more potential in developing sites across many of the rural communities where we can have a trickle-down effect in terms of visitor expenditure. Some of the developments will include, Madam Speaker, the development of the Chateau National Park at Rabaka. Uh, we're hoping we had a site visit just last week to establish the plans there as a design and as to how we proceed with the development of that park. On the leeward side, we have some sites such as the Leyu Petro Cliffs in Richmond, in Tromoka Bay, in Cumberland, Mount Twin, in Bokument, where we will see sandals being operational by next end of year, the completion and the oper operationalization of standards by early next year. Communities close to these hotels, Jackson Bay and Leyu, in Boca Mint, will see some development as well, um, surrounding, centered and surrounding community-based tourism initiatives, the establishment of, of gazebos, change rooms, vending stalls, all of these components which are important to developing the infrastructure around 
tourism for vendors and stakeholders and community-based groupings and organizations who stand to benefit from the tremendous spill-off which will come from the development that is coming, this new developmental thrust on tourism on mainland. In terms of new sites, in fact, this is one of the sites and the last part of the question which spoke to feasibility and environmental assessment. Clearly, that is something that we'll have to look at to see whether or not the feasibility of um, considering putting in an investment into that um, location. And once that is completed, we can see the development and the expansion of our annual work plan that deals with the tourism site improvements, which hopefully annually we can see new sites being added uh, to improve existing sites, but to also develop new sites um, for persons who, locals and persons who are visiting the island. So we do intend to have a very wide scope in terms of assessment, looking at sites across the entire country, and particularly on the mainland, and see so, you how we can in, in, in improve the infrastructure of existing sites and also develop new sites and attractions for persons. And I just want to note, Madam Speaker, that this development doesn't just rest with the private sector, with the public sector in terms of the government and its resources, but the private sector also has an important role to play. Just last week, I met a gentleman who is looking to import into St. Vincent some ATRs, this is the four-wheel bikes, in which he has developed a trail connecting from Brighton, Salpan, all the way back over into, um, I believe, Argyle and other places. And when that is open, Madam Speaker, it brings a new dimension to adventure tourism on mainland. Persons who can book a tour, go out and onto these, um, discover new trails, um, using the, these ATRs, ATVs. And similarly with water sports, we're looking at maybe wave runners and kayaks, and we're seeing the emerging um, a new sector with persons who are uh, bringing in kayaks and doing tours and so on. Um, even hiking to discovering new waterfalls. I didn't say dolphins here. <laughs> so all of these things, we're bringing a new dimension to... Um, well, unfortunately, we, we, we wouldn't be looking at that one and saying it will but... You know, we, we have to review the scope of that one. <laughs> but we, we well, when you, when you find it all things, we, we will naturally look at the development of all of these um, sites, look at regulations to guide the development of some of these new initiatives. And hopefully we can see uh, a more uh, different experience when it comes to um, the tourism sector on mainland. And, and also in the Grand Deans as well, uh, Madam Speaker. And I hope that fully answers the question, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to crave your indulgence in a bit of housekeeping. Yes. I omitted this morning to apologize for the absence of Senator Bruce, who is yes. out of state and uh, couldn't get flight back in time. Okay, thank you. Yes. Question number 21. Yes. Honorable Senator John. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to ask question 21, standing in my name, to the Honorable Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, Local Government, Gender Affairs, Family Affairs, Housing, and Informal Settlement, the persons attending the Voice of the Disabled Institution in San Susi are having problems with transportation to get to and from this institution. Will the Honorable Minister state if there are any plans in place to source a transport for this institution that will assist with the movement of these individuals? Yes. Honorable Minister of National Mobilization. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, <clears throat> and I'm happy that you raise this question. But before I answer the question in the affirmative, I want to put a few things um, into context, just quickly. Uh, there's, there's an umbrella organization that is responsible for the, 
for Persons with Disability. That's the National Society for Persons with Disability. And that, the institution um, <clears throat> called Voice of the Disabled is a, a branch of, of the main organization. And it is important because the location is in Georgetown, and it is part and parcel of decentralizing our services. So we appreciate this. San Susi, yes. Well, it, San Susi, yes, Prime Minister. Um, and we appreciate this because we want to make sure that persons who are specially able in the rural areas, that they are given all the necessary attention as it relates to their abilities. And, Madam Speaker, that organization has been doing tremendous work, and I must commend the, the lady who is at the helm. Uh, they have about 18 persons attending that the classes there. They range from craft. Um, they, they do CCSLC as well. And they have a, they have a good schedule. And from our, our, our side, the government has been providing them with a yearly subvention. We have been paying for all the staff there. Um, whether they are on the SEP program, we have persons on the YES program. We actually have someone who has a form of disability attached as a staff member there in that institution. And when, the, when I saw the question, it was the first time it was being drawn to my attention um, that they were having issues of transport. And I know the, the lady there, she has worked with us well. I would make, I would reach out. Miss, Miss, yes, Cheryl Adams, I would definitely reach out. Um, and I asked immediately after I saw the question for, to get a report. And from the report, she says she's paying about $200 a month um, to help with participants to get to and fro. I don't think it's an unreasonable ask. I would have a, a conversation with her. And, and also, just, just let me mention that we from the government, we saw it fit as well to assign to persons who are attending the classes other persons that can help them, whether if, if they are blind, to help them to get to and from their homes. So we have been doing our work. But I'm happy that the question was raised, and now it's, it's a matter of a phone call to Cheryl, and we can work out what we can do. So there are no plans currently, but I would, I would definitely, I'm giving you the, um, the affirmative that I would reach out and see how best we can sort out the situation there. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Yes. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, and looking forward for that assistance to these people. Yes. Question number 22. Question number 22, standing in my name, to the Honorable Minister of Transport, Works, Lands, and Physical Planning. Persons find it difficult to access their homes when it rains because of the current condition of the tract from Herbert King in Montebentic, Georgetown, to Alban Tony's Drun Toby's Junction, known as Swam Street. Will the Honorable Minister please state when will road work be done in this area to improve the condition? Yes, Honorable Prime Minister. This, this is um, a, a piece of road which the representative um, had asked for urgent consideration from the technical people. It's, I know the road well. It's about 380 feet in length by about 12, foot, 12 feet wide. And um, it's an open piece of road and they're going concrete it. That, that, that shouldn't, once, once we get, in fact, I don't even know if, if, if we necessarily need to wait on the, wait, wait, wait on the, the actual resources coming from the loan, which is financing the National um, Road Rehabilitation Program. This is, this is something which I think can be done, um, and we can always be reimbursed from the loan, so to speak, because it's, um, and there are little pieces like that here and there, and that is, that is, that is one, that is one of them. I have a few in my constituency too, they're all about. Yeah, it's all about, all about. And, 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 and as people are building, as people are getting more affluent and building better homes, 
this is one of the things. People are building better homes. And I said, we, we, we hear all the time that how the country is so poor and so on. But if you look at the houses from, if you look at the houses from, it used to be up to 2001. You, you see a lot of very good houses uniformly up to about diamond. Well, not even quite diamond, just before you reach diamond. But from diamond now to fancy and the windward. Look at the beautiful houses we have there. And same thing from, from um, beyond Kittel's going down to, to Fitzhugh's. Is, is, is fantastic. Fantastic development in the field of housing. Unprecedented in this country. So the, the, the roads in between, we have to make sure that we, like the, the piece like that, we have to fix them. Question number 23. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Question 23. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Standing in my name to the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Forestries, Fisheries, and Rural Transformation, Industry, and Labor. Access to water supply to farmlands is a problem for farmers in the North Windward constituency. Will the Honorable Minister please explain what plans are in place to address this issue? Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I have the answer here provided by the technicians, but before I go into that answer, I want to just speak a little on the subject matter of agriculture in North Windward. And uh, well, four weeks ago, we had a major consultation in Sandy Bay. The area rep representative was, was present. We had a turnout of over 120 farmers and fishers. And the situation is, is one whereby we have to look at the whole ecosystem in that the ash fall in North Windward, North Leeward, significant. And in the case of North Windward, those farmers who went, who returned to the lands, because of the, the heavy ash fall, and we, we sent in the tractors, but there's so much that the tractors could have done, there's significant work remaining for the tractor service says, without the tractors plowing in the ash to the soil, just putting the irrigation there will not work. So we are looking at the tractor services as a first phase because with drip irrigation, you have to prepare the lands first and then you put in the irrigation. So I'm coming to the answer. I just want us to understand the context because, and it's something that we are going to utilize some, some of the monies from the 10 million US dollars that we are going to get from the World Bank. And that program will be rolled out this year. Whilst the irrigation is critical, we have to do significant work with the soil first and then we put in the irrigation system. Major floods from excessive rainfall and lahars post the volcanic eruptions have caused significant damage to the public farm irrigation system throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The ministry will be launching a consultancy in June of this year regarding on-farm irrigation nationally. Quite naturally, a focus will be on all coastal areas from Purvanville to Sandy Bay. In the meantime, and this is exactly to answer the, the question in the interim, 350 farmers, predominantly in the red zone, will obtain irrigation support pursuant to the World Bank project, the UBEC, unleashing the blue economy of the Caribbean crisis response window under the Contingency Emergency Response Component, CERC. 
and that is going to happen this year. And the project has to be completed before December. So I would think that in another month or two that we should be seeing this assistance reaching the farmers. This would mainly include on-farm tanks and drip irrigation systems. But what we would have to do, we'd have to plow in the ash into the soil first, and then we roll out the irrigation system. Prior to this, though, we are going to increase the tractor service, and it's not said to plow the ash into the soil. And secondly, under the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, the following will be provided this year. 2,200 gallons water tanks, 25, 1,000, 25, 800, and the required drip lines and insulation platforms. The recovery efforts is critical this year because we have a significant task ahead, reduce the food import bill. We have signed on to the CARICOM 25 by 25, and there's a significant need for us to ramp up again the vegetable production in the constituency. And, uh, you know, I remember going into Sandy Bay in the immediate aftermath of the, the eruptions, and uh, I saw melted water tanks. Persons, the water tanks, the farmers, when the, the heat melted the water tanks, and uh, we have started a national drive to distribute the water tanks in the dry season. And what we are going to do too, is that we are going to work very closely with other ministries because having the water tank is one thing. Ensuring that you don't have mosquitoes breeding in them is another issue. And we have spoken to the farmers about this. Yes. So that is the answer to the question. Supplementary. Just for clarity, yes. you're saying that the distribution of the tanks. water tanks and so on will be within the, the Provenville Sandy Bay area of Provenville Fancy because we are looking at food security and we know that Fancy, oh, we are. Sandy Bay and those areas, a lot of food come out from those areas. So where exactly do you stop? The, the situation between Rabaka and Fancy, also in North Leeward, we just had a, a major public consultation in North Leeward, it is treated differently and will be given preferential treatment. But in terms of the modus operandi, Whilst we can take a tank, a water tank, to somebody, for example, in Bayabu and, and Pure Van Vale, that doesn't have that significant, did not have that significant ash fall, what we are going to do in North Windward is that we are going to ensure that the tractor services are provided first. Because those farmers, those, yes, all the way up to Oria, because those farmers who we spoke to said that even though they had the irrigation, because the, of the heavy ash cover, the vegetables died. Right. So it will go all the way up to fancy. Yes. Yes. Madam Clark. If I, I heard you talk about where the water coming from. We know that the the systems um, have been challenged and fragile in the, in, the, in, the, in the area. But CWSA has restored these quote-unquote fragile systems, but there is a big project under the, the World Bank program, which is going to go further up the, the, the slopes. And uh, the, the, the difficulty always up there, and, and the honorable member for West Kingston will know it because he has been involved with the Water Authority, was how to put the areas for the, 
the catchment in, in, in those particular areas um, near to the, 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 the volcano. And, uh, but there is a big project which is being financed from the, from the World Bank. The, the government is paying the soft loan, but we put it to the CWS as a grant. Yeah, to the, because remember, you know, the water up to, up to Orange Hill, in fact, even the lower part of Overland, as I, as I recall it, up to Orange Hill, you get the water from good quality, good supply of water from up in Perseverance. Because remember, the, 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 water, the water from Perseverance addresses above the river up to just below Overland. And yeah, just below Overland, yes. And down to, down to Georgetown, actually up to Chester. Yeah, and then, and then from there, the, the, the big system at Jennings deals from Byra coming down. So you, you, you're asking about the water. I'm just telling you what systems they have. I'm just telling you what systems they have. You know? But the, the details of those can be provided easily by CWSA. But there is a developmental program for that particular area. On, on this matter, please, because the, sen the comments I'm hearing both from the Minister of Agriculture as well as the Honorable Prime Minister uh, devoid of uh, logistical facts. It's one thing to talk about domestic water supply, but it's another thing to talk about irrigation and to say that you're putting tanks on farms in the dry season is an absolute waste of time given uh, that th in all of the areas we're talking about here, you have very porous soils, and uh, unless you go very high up in the mountains, some of these streams would be dry during the dry season. And irrigation is mainly required during the, 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 the dry season when the this, this stream flow is low. So none of this is making any, any sense. Honorable members. Very well. the, one, the one irrigation system that was properly designed and installed has been destroyed and has not been recovered. If you're telling me you're going to re-establish re re that magnificent facility that was put in there, that has tremendous scope for, for a lot of areas. Okay. Madam, Madam Speaker, government didn't destroy any irrigation system. Let me just say that because that is the, that is, that is the falsity which is presented. We could have a debate on water, you know. The problem with, with the Honorable Member for West Kingston. He, he left the Water Authority. The problem, well, I'm saying you have a problem. Your problem is that since you left the Water Authority in 2004, you always hark back to that. You mean to say you ain't do nothing since 2004? Honorable Member. And the Water Authority ain't do nothing since 2004? Honorable members, honorable members, that brings us. Honorable, oh, honorable members. That I did what? That I did what? Honorable members. Honorable, honorable member. Honorable members. Anybody can accuse anybody of anything, you know. Honorable members. Anybody can accuse anybody of anything. Honorable members. I could accuse you of all kinds of things. Honorable members, I am on my feet. I am on my feet. Let us bring the decorum back to this honorable house. We are at the end of question, the question and answer period. Madam Clark, we're at the orders of the day. Orders of the day on yes. the bills. Item number one. Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Amendment Bill 2023. We've had just a moment. Honorable members, 
We've had the reading, we've had the announcement of the first bill on the order paper. The Honourable Prime Minister, give way. Madam Speaker, I'm looking here at the, at the order paper, and <clears throat> based on what's set down here, we are at a motion, right? No, we're not. There is not a motion on the paper? There's a motion on the paper, but it's not for debate today. But why is it on the order paper? Because the, how, the, the, the manner in which notice is given to the members is when it, it appears on the order paper. Yes, but it's given for the meeting of the house that's coming up. Yes, so and that's perfectly in order. This matter here yes. is a member can bring, a private member can bring a bill, any, a motion anytime in this house. Yes. But this expectation is it's on the order paper. When you get to the motion, you'll debate it. No. Is that not the case? No, because... Where does it sit out in the rules? No, because it says, it, the rules specifically say at standing order 22, I believe it is, when the motions by private members will be debated. No, it but doesn't say that. 22 says when it's given priority. When it's given priority, yes. yes. So, that, so, that it, so that we all know that if there is any motion, it is given priority for the third meeting of the House. That's correct. Yes. And we but have, up until, separate, we have yes. up until 5 o'clock in which private members' business can be dealt with ordinarily. Yes. And in my interpretation, beyond that, on the third meeting, Yes. But we are now, it's not five o'clock yet, we are now at the point where motions can be considered by private members. It's on... No, but it's not the third meeting. This is not the but third meeting. why is it then, if it's for the third meeting, why is it set down because, here? Because, Honorable Member, and I'm happy that you've raised it, because the, the, there's a very interesting point of which I've done extensive research on notice. And, no, I'm about to explain. If, we, if you walk with me to stand in order 20... 24 it says where under any standing order notice is required such notice shall be given in writing signed by the member and addressed to the clerk such notice shall be handed to the clerk or sent to or left at the clerk's office during the hours pres prescribed for that purpose there are no guidelines, no set rules as it pertains to when the notice should be given. Save and accept um, in instances of the presentation of questions. So I did the research and I said, well, how then is notice given? Because I had that, that conversation with myself. And the learning tells us that notice is given when it appears on the order paper. However, you can give the notice, and members are entitled, as long as the, the office, the clerk's office receives the motion, to share with the members as a matter of urgency so that everybody has notice of it. What the, the learning also tells you is that a member can indicate when they wish for that particular motion to be debated. That is what we have before you. So in this particular instant, this is not a motion to be debated today. But certainly, I am sure that all members would appreciate having more than early notice of it. And that is why it is here. But it won't be debated today. I just have one question, Madam Speaker, therefore. Yes. As you know, um, <clears throat> on the third meeting, ordinarily, private members, usually the opposition, submit a motion. It's the... Yes, that's what's been happening. No, 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 no. That's not fully correct. And I've, I've, I've sat in this house in a I've different capacity. I've been in this capacity. house for 20 years. I know that that yes, is what's happening. Yes, I too have I've sat in this house and I've followed the proceedings of the house. It is usual that private members will bring up um, opposition yes. members, but there are other members who are also considered private that. members more than the opposition. What I wish to ask, however, yes, go is ahead. that our motions, therefore, dealt with in priority based on the time in which they are submitted. Does this mo motion pre pre preempt a motion that is presented by another private member, say, when the sitting actually comes up? They, That's what they, it is. They come in the order as they are so that is the purpose of it. Yes, they come in the Thank order. You. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, I understand. The motions, no, because you may have an understanding, but I need to be clear. The motions, they are presented and they will come in the order as received. Very well. Thank you for that. Honorable Minister of 
Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move that a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be read a first time. Honorable Members, the question is, that's a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be read a first time. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move on the standing order 48 to that this bill be taken through all its stages at today's sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that this bill be taken through all its stages pursuant to Standing Order 48-2 at this sitting. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178 of the Laws of St. Vincent and Grandin, Revised Edition 2009, be read a second time. Honorable Members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be read a second time. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Debate on the bill. Honorable Prime Minister, you have one hour. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, the issue of the prevention of trafficking in persons is a vital matter of citizen and national security. It is one of the more serious offenses, and especially when young persons are trafficked, when persons who are challenged are trafficked, persons who are economically disadvantaged are trafficked. It is a matter Madam Speaker, which international organizations, including the United Nations, and countries across the world are taking very strong stances on and have taken them. And that's why we, Madam Speaker, passed the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act 2011. Trafficking may originate in a particular country. Sometimes it may appear seemingly innocent, but not at all. Your country could be used as a conduit for persons to be trafficked. And invariably, those who are trafficked endure immense pain and suffering, exploitation, injury, personal injury, and maiming, and even death. And I think all of us have read upon this subject, and we have noted some outrageous stories, some things which touch your consciences very deeply. And there is a trend globally for offenses increasingly, for offenses touching and concerning trafficking in persons that the judiciary be given no discretion to provide a fine that it should be 
a term of imprisonment once you are found guilty. I know the debate would arise, as has arisen in several jurisdictions, that are you not encroaching on the separation of powers between the judiciary and the legislature by providing for mandatory term of imprisonment. But I think legislators across the world are increasingly insisting on this. And we are persuaded that in the current circumstances and with regional and global international criminal gangs who profit from trafficking in persons, we should provide for mandatory term of imprisonment in these offenses which are on, indict on indictment, that is to say, go before the High Court. That is the general position behind the bill. So, Madam Speaker, the schedule sets out the changes to five different provisions. We may have need to come back to some other amendments to the Trafficking in Persons Act, the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, but we thought that it would be timely to make this particular, these particular changes. And I'm hopeful that we get unanimous support of the House. We have set up a trafficking, a prevention, a trafficking in persons unit, and every quarter in accordance with the act, reports come to me as Minister of National Security and they're taken and Prime Minister, and they're taken to the cabinet. And these reports are approved and sent to all our various international agencies and partners where we are cooperating on this particular matter. Indeed, I should say, Madam Speaker, at the recent CARICOM meeting, we, we got reports on regional trafficking in persons and links between persons out of Africa and into from Latin America um, and to Europe and to the United States and other countries in between. And matter of trafficking. Also, Madam Speaker, is often accompanied by persons involved in the trafficking in drugs and trafficking in guns. Sometimes it's for persons, male and female, to be trafficked for sexual exploitation. Sometimes it's to really have persons in circumstances as though they are slaves or semi-slaves. And there are some people, and I know the, the British government and our own government have been in contact regarding some attempts by some persons to traffic individuals to go to this or that European country. Usually the temptation is to get some person say you're going babysitting. And there are many stories. It may seem some people get very, it's innocu it sounds innocuous. 
You get an opportunity to go somewhere to do babysitting. Well, you're not going to do babysitting. Or if you're doing that, that might be introductory, Madam Speaker. And even that itself involves trafficking because they take your passport, the, 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 the people who are trafficking, and they, they pay you minimum wages. They, it, it, it is a, it's a whole, but less than minimum wages. And, and it's really your freedoms are restrained, taken away. So, we have to, we consider that it's necessary and desirable for us to do something. There's some, some persons in the criminal justice system, and I'm not talking about persons who are involved in prosecutors or in the law enforcement agencies, but some people slight it, but it is a serious matter. So, a very serious one. So in section five, one, the offense of trafficking in persons, a person who engages in, conspires to engage in, attempts to engage in, assists another person to engage in, or organizes or directs another person to engage in trafficking in persons, commits an offense and is liable on conviction on indictment, that is, before judge and jury at the high court. The current pen punishment is to a fine of $250,000 or a term of imprisonment of, for 15 years or both. Well, the amendment takes away the fine and the or both. Imprisonment for 15 years. Section six, this is an offense of unlawful withholding of identification papers. That is to say a person who for the purpose of trafficking in persons and acting in purporting or purporting to act as another person's employer, manager, supervisor, contractor, employment agent, or solicitor or client, such as a pimp, knowingly procures, destroys, conceals, removes, confiscates, or poss possesses any passport, immigration document, or other government identification document, whether actual or purported, belonging to another person, commits an offense, and is liable on conviction on the indictment, currently to a fine of $100,000 or to imprisonment for 12 years or both. If we pass this amendment today, it would be a mandatory term of imprisonment for 12 years. Section seven, one, offense of transporting a person for the purpose of exploiting such a person um, for prostitution, Currently, the, the, the fine is $100,000 or imprisonment for 12 years or both. It would be for the 12 years. It reads, any person who knowingly transports or conspires to transport or attempts to transport or assist any other person engaged in transporting any person in St. Vincent and Grenadines or across an international border for the purposes of exploiting the person's prostitution commits an offense and is liable, now it would be to a conviction on indictment for 12 years. And then, Madam Speaker, section 13. This is to say receiving financial or other benefit knowing that it is as a result of trafficking in persons. The offense is every person who receives a financial or other benefit knowing that it results from the offense of trafficking in persons commits an offense and is liable on conviction on indictment, that is before judge and jury, currently to a fine of $200,000 or imprisonment for 10 years or both. There would be no fine and therefore there would be no both mandatory imprisonment. And Section 18, this is the 
offense. of threatening or obstructing a police officer. It reads, any person who threatens, assaults, or obstructs a police officer acting in the execution of his duty under this act commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction, that is to say before the magistrate's court. Currently, it's a fine of $5,000 or to imprisonment for one year or both it would be mandatory for one year. I think I've dealt with all five, Madam Speaker. Huh? Uh, well, there, there. Hold on. Let me, let me. I, I'll just look at the the definition. Bear with me. I think I think the drafters would 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 that is something which the drafters could probably look at without with, with any further amendment. Um, the, or the overall object of this, the, the act which we passed in 2011, is to prescribe measures to prevent and combat trafficking in persons by a, providing a framework for protecting and assisting victims, b providing the means to effectively investigate, prosecute, and suppress all forms of trafficking in persons, and see promoting cooperation between St. Vincent Grenadines and other states in order to prevent and suppress trafficking in persons and to punish offenders. Um, I, I just want to say, Madam Speaker, the, the trafficking in persons unit works very much in tandem with the sexual offenses unit and also work in, content with the, in conjunction with the major crimes unit of the criminal investigation department of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. And we work, I assure honorable members, it's a matter in which we work very closely with the regional security system, with CARICOM Impacts, the Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, with Interpol, and with the governments of the United States of America, Canada, Britain, the European Union, generally, countries in Latin America, um, and of course, the relevant agencies at the United Nations. I, I said to this honorable house, expect pushback from some persons who are in the legal profession. Some I say, who have a, a view of the separation of powers, which don't like this kind of legislation. But we have to say and do something as the people's representatives. And it is not unusual that you may have a tension between sometimes different arms of the state. And of course, nobody interferes with the independence of the judiciary. I, I think, Madam Speaker, I've given the best of my learning and experience on this matter and presented for the consideration of this honorable house. I'm obliged. For the debate, for the, yes, I recognize the honorable. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to make a 
contribution on this debate of this bill, the amendment to the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. Madam Speaker, let me start straight off the bat by saying that we support the amendment and the direction in which the amendment takes the law and the indication as to our seriousness regarding this offense, this crime in this country. Madam Speaker, as I understand it, and it's fairly clear from the legislation what is happening, that the bill that was passed in the Parliament in 2011, the act that was passed, provided a discretion for either imprisonment or a fine of $250,000. Even the fine in itself, when you think that you are liable up to 15 years, you know, the fine, you would say, 250. That sounds like the cost of doing business to some of these people who are involved in these trafficking offenses. Given our tragic history in the Caribbean, Madam Speaker, our history, the way most of the people in this country came, in, in, in the Caribbean, came to be here, is the ultimate act or program or system of trafficking that the world has ever seen. African-Caribbean slavery, African-American slavery. We in this region, Madam Speaker, have, I believe, not just a right but an obligation to speak strongly and clearly with respect to human trafficking in the modern era. 25 million people are estimated to be in some form of modern day slavery, as they call it today, in this 23rd year of the 21st century. That is simply not something that we should contemplate, far less accept in this day and age. So penalties and statements and programs and facilities, resources within our country and within countries around the world must be brought to bear to bringing an end to this problem. Madam Speaker, this problem and the persons who engage in these sorts of activities of soliciting principally women, young women and girls into situations defined broadly as human trafficking, mostly for sexual exploitation, for unpaid labor, that we have to, Madam Speaker, send a clear signal that this is not something that we in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that we tolerate, and that even where our resources may not match our statements at this point, we have to make the right statements. The persons who engage in these activities, they prey on the most vulnerable people. Often people who are fleeing poverty, crime, natural and human and man-made disasters and they offered all sorts of inducements. And they leave with such high expectations and sometimes spending all of their family resources to do so, only to wind up in a worse situation. 
Just thinking about that, Madam Speaker. You think that 15 years is enough for somebody who is convicted of engaging in such an activity? Surely a fine could never be satisfactory. And I know that we have been criticized, this country, when I say we, this country has been criticized for having that on its books. The most recent report of the U.S. State Department's report on human trafficking mentioned that as one of the factors that accounts for St. Vincent and the Grenadines' position on tier two of their four-tier four rank, ranking of countries around the world. We must get the highest standard, whatever ranking, by whichever institution. We should be able at some point in this country to say that we are at the very top of the list of any questions and that any questions that are asked about our position would not leave us wanting. Madam Speaker, the persons who become victims or survivors, as I've said, are the most vulnerable. The persons who take advantage of them, they pick on the weakest. Persons with expectations. But what is more modern speaking in this day and age, the reason why the problem seems to be getting worse rather than getting better. It's so much easier to move around. And there are so many tools at the disposal of those persons who would wish to take advantage of others. The internet. All of the various tools which had been created, some with good intentions, can be put to harmful and destructive use. And that is being part of the problem here as well. So that there is a requirement that given this availability of the means of essentially carrying on their nefarious activities and wooing, soliciting, engaging people into situations of human trafficking. That those means have become more widespread, more easily accessible, and more powerful for those persons who wish to misuse them. So therefore, on the other hand, on the other side of things, Law enforcement and the international community and decent people all over the world have to send an increasingly strong message back. It may not be easy to police every child's cell phone or tablet or laptop or everything that is put out there that may entice someone to accept what looked like a promising offer, as the Prime Minister mentioned. And for those persons, they have no real education into the dangers that they pose because the people who are doing the soliciting, they are some of the most skilled at doing that. And they can persuade, trick, Even capable people, what about that? I mean people who are experienced and should know better. We've seen examples of that even here in this country. So, I think it is appropriate for us to send a stronger message to say, well, listen, you engage in this activity. We know it may be difficult to catch you, but when we do, you will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law and you will go to jail. Whether it's six months, six years, or up to 15 years, there will be no fine that could be written off as the cost of doing business. You will spend some time 
away from your family. And I'll have time to reflect on the harm that your activities cause. And that is for people here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, or those who may think that we are an easy sphere in which to operate and to bring the nefarious activities here. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister re read out some of the sentences. The range from one year for obstructing a police officer, and I agree with my colleague, the Honourable Member of Central Kingsdown, that consideration should be given to including immigration officers here as well, because they are frontline people who are in contact with persons who may be trafficked, and they are trained in detecting these situations as well. So anybody who interferes instruct and obstructs them in the performance of their duties really is preventing them from getting to what might be a very serious problem of human trafficking, that that person should, well, those persons should include the immigration officers as well. So the, the, the sentences, Madam Speaker, range from one year for such persons who are obstructing a peace officer. And I checked, there's no definition of police officer in the act. It doesn't include immigration officer. Uh, up, to 10 year, up to 15 years for a person who was engaged in the specific act of trafficking. Madam Speaker, at some point, I know that in the international community, because the task of combating this problem is so huge, especially in times of crisis and upheaval, you would think that the COVID crisis has created, had created a, a situation where the problem might have been essentially reduced, at least for the time during the crisis. But from what we're hearing, what we're reading from the international agencies that study the problem, is that the crisis itself created more hardship within certain countries that made those persons who fall victims to the traffickers more vulnerable to the inducements. Madam Speaker, we have an obligation not just to send a strong message in our sentencing in the legislation. Because we know that catching those persons, as we have seen from our own record, the reporting of our own record, we haven't had any conviction since, what, seven or eight years? But one of the ways in which to combat the problem, and there are a number of ways, but legislation and prosecution is but one. One of the ways of doing so, Madam Speaker, is to create opportunities within our own countries to increase the, since women and young girls are the principal victims, opportunities for them to find economic independence, economic security, to have access to education and information and so forth, so that the inducements may not seem so attractive. We have also in our enforcement mechanisms here, underground, the unit in the police service that was created to deal with this problem that is properly trained and properly resourced, so that it can function effectively, and it's not simply looks as though it is there to satisfy some requirement that the international community expects of us. They should be there to function effectively, to deal with the problem, prosecute persons who are engaged in the activity and bring them to justice. Legislatures all the time set minimum penalties. I've seen minimum fines for various things that are less serious than this. So I don't see that there's a problem in saying that 
the court really has to deal only with sentencing because it has a range. You're not saying you have to put it to be 15 years. It has to be 10 years. It says you're liable to that penalty. So it could be anything up to that. So there's some flexibility still remaining in the judge. So, Madam Speaker, we in the opposition, you know, we would like to see, as I say, that our country, of all the things that we continue to be criticized for in this area, that we can fix those, and on any ranking system, that we will be at the very top. But this is a step in the right direction. And well, we have quite a long way to go. I think every country has its shortcomings. We maybe have some more than others and less than others. But we must always strive to do our very best. And as I said at the outset, given our history of slavery in the Caribbean, the impact it has had, the place that that has in terms of the scale of the human tragedy that was created, the ultimate. We have a right, an obligation, a duty to speak loudly and clearly on this issue, not just here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but throughout the Caribbean. And we can send that message here in this parliament, Madam Speaker, by saying that both sides of the House are united in this particular matter. We may talk on different sides, in different issues, but in this, Madam Speaker, I'm absolutely committed to having St. Vincent and the Grenadines be a leading country in respect to fighting human trafficking. Thank you. For the debate. For the debate. Yes, I recognize the honorable member for East Kingstown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, um, <clears throat> let me, from the very outset, first of all, express appreciation to the Honorable Prime Minister for presenting this bill. And more importantly, to express to express my f very full support and align myself, myself sorry, unconditionally to the comments made by my leader, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, with regards to this issue. Madam Speaker, I recall when I was the alternate representative for St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the OAS some years ago. This issue was, in some respects, in the international community and certainly in, in this hemispheric community of nations, somewhat uh, new or pioneered, pioneering in terms of addressing the issue with legislation and so on. And I have, in some respects, continued following this and other issues. And so I believe I speak with some degree of authority when I refer to the mechanisms which I will touch on in a little bit. But I just want to contextually establish, Madam Speaker, honorable members, that when we speak about trafficking in persons, one must understand that this phenomenon is embedded in the wider concept of violence, particularly violence against women and children, because I think it, is, it has been established that trafficking in persons, predominant, the victims are predominantly women. And so when we talk about violence against women and children, I believe that our efforts 
at combating trafficking in persons must also uh, entail efforts at combating violence against women and children. So based on the definition of trafficking in persons, it involves more than just the physical movement of persons. And it was the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan who said with regards to trafficking in persons on the occasion of the signing of the convention of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the protocols thereto. And I'd like to quote former Secretary General Annan because I believe it is important for us to re-emphasize and reiterate the significance of this phenomenon called trafficking in persons, not just to human development, but also to the development of our communities, our nation, and our hemisphere and the globe in particular, and the world in general. And Secretary General Annan said, and I quote, I believe the trafficking of persons, particularly women and children, for forced and exploitative labor, including for sexual exploitation, is one of the most egregious violations of human rights that the United Nations now confronts. This was back in, 20, in 2000. It is widespread and growing. It is rooted in social and economic conditions in the countries from which the victims come. And I want to re-emphasize that, Madam Speaker. It is rooted in social and economic conditions in the countries from which the victims come, facilitated by practices that discriminate against women and driven by cruel indifference to human suffering on the part of those who exploit the services that the victims are forced to provide. He concludes by saying, the fate of these most vulnerable people in our world is an affront to human dignity and a challenge to every state, every people, and every community. Madam Speaker, here in our hemisphere, we as an independent nation, and before I get into that, sorry, I also want to make reference to the comments made by my esteemed leader, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, with regards to our historical reality of slavery. And, and when he started making the comments, I was wondering if he had peeped into my notes, because I also developed some comments in that regard. <laughs> and the ultimate expression of the distasteful act of trafficking in persons is indelibly, indelibly embedded in our historical experience. And, and I'm, I'm reading what I wrote here just to show you, as they say, you know, we, we, are, we are on the same team and there's ve very much, very little variance. And, and this is a very, I don't mean, mean to make light of this issue, but just, to, just to, um, to indicate that we are in unison on this. The, the currently debated issue of trafficking in persons cannot be discussed nor addressed void of a historical perspective which especially conjures up images and learned accounts of painful, wicked, and inhumane experiences of our black and beautiful African ancestors. More importantly, I would feel less than genuine if I were to omit and I will omit that part. <laughs> However, Madam Speaker, an important feature of slavery and the slave trade was the brutal and orchestrated violence against and exploitation of our women, mothers, wives, sisters, daughters, aunts. This feature has made its way into and perpetrated and perpetuated by our damaged and brainwashed black males. Violence against women, and trafficking in persons in particular, usually have their genesis in the vulnerability of women, mainly economically vulnerable, who are looking for a better life. And so, I echo again 
the, the sentiments of the honorable leader of the opposition that we cannot approach this particular issue or we have to approach this particular issue by sending a strong and clear indication by this parliament in particular that we are serious about dealing with this matter. I permit me, Madam Speaker, honorable members, to very quickly just refer to two or maybe three of the instruments of which we in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are a state's party that can help us to broaden our approach to addressing this issue. I first refer to the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and Eradication of Violence Against Women, which is more commonly referred to as the Convention of Belém de Para. This hemispheric instrument was ad adopted in Belém, Brazil, on June the 9th, 1994. It was signed by St. Vincent and the Grenadines on March the 5th, 1996, and ratified on the 25th of May of that same year, and the instrument was deposited on May the 31st, 1996. I am going to just go quickly to some of what I consider to be, or what I paraphrase to be, action items that we have signed on to in this convention. And I refer to chapter three of the convention, which talks about duties of the states the states who have signed on to, con to this convention, these are some of the duties to which we have agreed to undertake. Article 7, for example, states that the states' parties condemn all forms of violence against women and agree to pursue by all appropriate means and without delay policies to prevent, punish, and eradicate such violence and undertake to a, refrain from engaging in any act or practice of violence against women and to ensure that their authorities, officials, personnel, agents, and institutions act in conformity with this obligation. So in other words, the state as an entity and the state's agents ought not to engage in any practice and to ensure that um, we, we, we desist from any acts of violence against women. I'm just going through these real quickly because I, I, because I don't think it's necessary to go through all of them, but I'd like to pinpoint a few of them just to reemphasize and maybe to um, further encourage us as the lawmakers in this country to focus a little bit more. And I'm, I, of, of course, I'm quite sure that things are... are, are activities have been done within the realm of these conventions, of these international instruments. But given the seriousness of this, um, of this social phenomenon, violence against women and trafficking in, in persons in particular, I believe that we ought to re-emphasize and redouble our efforts, guided, of course, by some of the provisions in these conventions, in these international instruments. For example, um, we agreed to take all appropriate measures, including legislative, legislative measures, to amend or repeal existing laws and regulations or to modify legal or customary practices which sustain the persistence and tolerance of violence against women. And I believe what we're doing here today is an example of, 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 of our adherence and our um, um, commitment to ensuring that this particular, this particular um, clause takes root. I also, Madam Speaker, would like to reference to Article 8 of that same Chapter 3 in the Inter-American Convention on on the prevention, punishment, and eradication of violence against women. Article 8 talks about the state's parties agree to undertake progressively specific measures, including programs such as A, 
to promote awareness and observance of the right of women to be free from violence and the right of women to have their human rights respected and protected. B, to modify social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women, including the development of formal and informal educational programs appropriate to every level of the educational process to counteract prejudices, customs, and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority or superiority of either of the sexes or on the stereotyped roles for men and women which legitimize or exacerbate violence against women. C, to promote the education and training of all those involved in the administration of justice, police, and other law enforcement officers, as well as other personnel responsible for implementing policies for the prevention, punishment, and eradication of violence against women. D, to provide appropriate specialized services for women who have been subjected to violence through public and private sector agencies, including shelters, counseling services for all family members where appropriate, and care and custody of the affected children. And I would encourage honorable members to locate this particular instrument and, and listeners, of course, to and, and familiarize themselves with, or better familiarize themselves, or in some cases, remind ourselves of the provisions in this convention. But the point I'm making, Madam Speaker, honorable members, is that we already have material with which we can work to strengthen our efforts at combating this particular issue. We signed on to it. We are a state's party to this convention. And I, I believe that as monumental a task as it is to really and truly address this issue in ways which would be, I consider, most admirable for the benefit of all involved, I believe that we ought to explore every opportunity and expose ourselves to every possible instrument, material, and or resource so to do. Hence my reason for referencing this particular convention and also, to just conclude by referencing another inter-American agency, the Inter-American Commission of Women, which is called the SIN in our hemispheric, in our hemispheric setup, falls under the auspices of the Organization of American States as well. And I wish to refer to the Inter-American Commission of Women, the Declaration of San Jose on the Economic and Political Empowerment of the Women of the Americas. This was adopted, this declaration was adopted uh, at the fourth plenary session, session of the SIM held on October the 30th, 2012. And here are some, in this declaration, we also, we St. Vincent and the Grenadines also signed on to what again I consider as action items. For example, one, We hereby declare our commitment in the area of violence and citizen security. One, to urge states to allocate, the, to allocate the necessary budgetary and human resources to national mechanisms for the advancement of women so as to fully comply with their national plans and programs responsible for the eradication of all forms of gender-based violence and the protection of and attention to women who have been subjected to violence in the framework of citizen security policies. Two, to call on the states to promote access to justice for women who have been subjected to gender-based violence by enforcing in a comprehensive and cost-cutting manner at all procedural stages, the provisions established by applicable international human rights instruments, including, as appropriate, 
the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and Eradication of Violence Against Women, to which I referred just a minute ago. Madam Speaker, I know that, that much of what I'm saying may not be very sexy to the ordinary listener, but I consider this to be extremely important because it doesn't make sense for us to become a states party and sign on to all of these multilateral instruments. And we don't use them to our benefit. And I am urging and encouraging all of us, and more specifically, the responsible government agencies and institutions and individuals, starting with the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, for example, the Honorable Minister of National Security. Let us put greater effort into extracting from these instruments and from these conventions to which we have signed on much more to our benefit so that we can really and truly create a, 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 a very serious and the, the seriously desirable impact of confronting this problem. So, like the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I would like to again echo my full support as a proud member of the Opposition for this legislation and the direction in which we are going in terms of addressing this issue. But I would also like to conclude by re-emphasizing the need for us to really and truly zero in on what's available to us to make our jobs or to make our efforts at addressing this issue much more effective. Thank you. Yes, further debate. Further debate. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I'm very pleased that both sides of this Honorable House share an identical position on this matter before us, that is to say, to provide for mandatory imprisonment for various offenses under the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, and for all the sentiments which all of us have expressed. Madam Speaker, just as a matter of important completion of the circle, so to speak, in addition to the hemispheric um, conventions and declarations mentioned by the Honorable Member for, Central, for East Kingston, I just want to remind everyone that the overarching operative international convention is that which we have enacted as the schedule to the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. That is to say, the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, supplementing the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. We had, in fact, signed on to the United Nations Convention against transnational crime. And this protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, which supplements that United Nations Convention, is to be read together, interpreted together, with the United Nations Convention against transnational organized crime. I, I, I wanted to make that point for completeness because it is, it is important to know the particular protocol and the convention upon which we ground the cooperation specifically in relation to the punishing, the prevention, suppression, punishment of trafficking in persons, especially women and children, but not only women and children, other persons too. Madam Speaker, I would just like to take a few minutes to ask our young people, and it is true that 
the most of the persons who are trafficked are women. But increasingly, a large number of men, young men are being trafficked for forced labor and also for sexual exploitation, given the world in which we live. And I want to advise young persons that when you have this device called the computer, the cell phone, when you have the tablet or any international communication device, please understand that the person who is at the end of it, who is that person or persons who are seeking to induce you into activities where you are going to be trafficked, you must be very, very careful and very cautious. And it has been done easier nowadays because of modern electric, um, modern technological information technology. I want to emphasize that and I want the young people to know this. And parents and guardians, I also want you, when your young your daughter, your son comes and says there's this opportunity, seek advice on it. If, if they're asking you to come to the United Kingdom to be a babysitter, go to the Labor Department. Go to your priest. Go to your teacher. Go to someone whom you respect in the community, somebody who is going to advise you. I'm urging you as a practical matter because we have to try and avoid the trafficking. And it begins by people having the information and being sensitive as to what is taking place. And, and I am sure that many members in this honorable house have people coming to them about all these babysitting and other opportunities. Sometimes they tell you it's their families. No, it's going to send for them and say, but you have a work permit. Not only in the United Kingdom, but places in the Caribbean too. I want you to know that. If you, if you don't listen to me about anything else that I have said today, I want you to listen to that. I want to say also to young athletes, male and female, when you get opportunities to go overseas, go to the Ministry of Sports. Don't just rely on what a coach tells you or somebody contact you through somebody in England or in America or somewhere. Check it out. There are, I'm, I'm talking about areas in our country where we see some of these challenges and there are persons who are somebody who may be a performing a young person a teenager who is a performing artist somebody in Jamaica might tell them there's an opportunity or in Trinidad check it out 
Because it's through all of these seemingly innocent things that you have trafficking in persons taking place. I, I'm, 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 I'm talking uh, with my feet planted on the ground. And I'm talking about many persons I've had to advise and who come to me and ask me and thankfully when they come I advise them. Some of course wouldn't come. Some may go to other persons or some, some don't go at all and they fall into these traps. Another area is the area of adoption of children, persons under the age of 18. Now, I want to say to anybody who wants to be an intermediary for adoption, to know that if you, if you're an immigration consultant or a lawyer, it doesn't give you any immunity, you know. You know that you're trafficking the person or you ought reasonably to know or to have known. They can't hold their documents either. I'm talking about practical things. We talked a lot of the larger issues, and, and I agree with everything which has been said, but I want to impart, as I wind up this debate, some practical advice. The advice I'm giving is not, it is, it is not exhaustive, but these are things which have come to my attention. Of course, we have checks and balances in the adoption process, but sometimes you have these checks and balances not working as well as they should work for all sorts of different reasons. And I, I just want to say I speak on this from the, my, my van, the vantage point of being grounded in the community, been a lawyer for many years, and, and, and since I hold the position that I hold, as you will reasonably suspect, many things come to my attention, which I can't speak about in any specific manner in terms of names and the like, but all I'm, I'm urging that we exercise extreme care in this matter. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this Honorable House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House to consider this bill clause by clause. Clause two, that clause two stands part of the bill. That the, sh that the schedule, that the schedule stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause one, that clause one stands part of the bill. Aye. Minister. Madam Chairperson, I beg to move that the committee rise, the House resume, and the presiding member report to this honorable house. Honorable members, the question is that the, that the committee rise and the Honorable uh, Chairperson reports to the House. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. Honorable members, I have the honor to report that's a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, has passed the committee stage.
Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move that a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178 of the A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be read a third time by title and passed. Honorable Members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act, Chapter 178A of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition, 2009 be read a third time by title and passed. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Amendment Act 2023. Item number three, Civil Aviation Amendment Bill 2023. Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move that a bill before an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Revised Edition 2009, be ready for first time. Second. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77, be read a first time. As many as are that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, I beg to move on the Standing Order 482 that the bill be taken through all its stages at this sitting. Honorable members, the question is that this bill be taken through all stages at this sitting in accordance with Standing Order 48.2. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the bill for an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 2009, be read a second time. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77, be read a second time. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Debate on the bill. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Civil Aviation Amendment Bill. 2023 seeks to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77 of the Laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Revised Edition 2009. The bill, Madam Speaker, gives effect to amendments made to the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Agreement to implement measures approved to have the Category 1 status restored to OECS member states. As you recall, Madam Speaker, in April of 2020, the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority was audited, and of course we had some challenges with member states within the ECA, having not met the requirements in terms of safety and oversight and some regulatory issues which presented themselves when the Federal Aviation Administration did the audit. So there were some issues of compliance. The amendments, Madam Speaker, to the agreement in this bill will be implemented in St. Vincent and the Grenadines through the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Agreement amendment of schedule order, and will empower the authority, which is the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority, Madam Speaker, to do several of the following things. One, to make, develop, issue, revise, and enforce harmonized civil aviation regulations, rules, policies, and practices, chart to be adopted and applied by the participating member states and to be implemented and to apply standards and recommended practices adopted by the International Civil 
Aviation Organization. And uniformly, Madam Speaker, within all of the participating states. Secondly, it will make, develop, issue, revise, and enforce civil aviation regulations, rules, directives, standards, policies, and practices in the participating states. So it is, in fact, an amendment which will be harmonized across member states of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. And according to the amendment, to the agreement, the regulations, directives, and standards issued by the authority shall have full force and effect when all steps have been taken as necessary to give legal effect to them in each of the participating states. So all of the directives, Madam Speaker, issued by the authority will be published in the official gazette of each participating state. And in any case, no longer than 90 calendar days from the date of issuance. And of course, the authority may notify the public of regulations, directives, and standards that are to be uh, decided upon. As I stated, Madam Speaker, these regulations will essentially be adopted and enacted harmoniously within member states. Before the authority issues any regulations, Madam Speaker, they will have to consult with each participating state. And of course, enable a meaningful consultation. The Director General of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority and other competent authorities of the participating state will establish and maintain an efficient system of consultation and at the national and at regional levels structured to ensure that the competent authorities are adequately informed and provided, revel provided revelant in rev re relevant information and the process to reinforce by consultations. I have to outline that, Madam Speaker, because what we're going into, and as I outlined the provisions, essentially, the amendments will remove a lot of the authority given to the minister in the respective member states to facilitate the issuance of license, investigation, of claims, and the regulatory processes as it relates to the administration within the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation, the jurisdiction in which we function. And it places, Madam Speaker, a lot of the responsibilities and obligations now with the Director General of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. Madam Speaker, the bill has 22 clauses, and I will take you through what the amendments will indicate. Clause 1, Madam Speaker, as you know, would provide for the short title. Clause 2 would amend Section 2 of the existing act by inserting the definition of the, for the term state safety program and unlawful interference. Clause 3 would amend Section 4 of the act to indicate that the minister's responsibility for development and supervision of the matters related to the civil aviation in, is subject to Section 10, 11, and 49 which provides for the powers of the Director General. The issue of directives by the Director General and the making of regulations by the Director General. What Section 10 of the existing Act provides for, Madam Speaker, is the appointment of the Director General. Section 11 speaks to the issuing of directives and Section 49 speaks to re radio and radio navigation requirements for aircrafts. Clause 6 
would amend section 10 of the act, inserting a new subsection 7. And the new subsection 7 provides that in the exercise of the powers or discharge of functions listed in the subsection, the Director General acts independently and is not subject to the influence or directive from any person or authority. Clause 9 would amend section 31 of the Act by providing for the appointment of investigators or empowering the ministers to delegate investigators to another state or a regional accident and incident investigation organization, and in this case, the ECA, or any other regional body. Clause 10 would amend section 32 by providing for the powers of the investigator in charge. And Clause 11 would amend section 33 by prescribing the investigation records that cannot be disclosed unless by an order of the court. And this is for purposes other than accident or incident investigation as it relates to civil aviation, uh, Madam Speaker. Clause 12 would amend section 38 to allow the Director General to prescribe the regulations to be made and to give effect to the notice referred to in the section. Clause 14 would repeal and replace section 46 and provide for the powers of an inspector or a person to whom the Director General has delegated functions under section 13 of the Parent Act. Clause 15, Madam Speaker, would amend section 49 to enable the Director General to make regulations mentioned within the section. Currently, Madam Speaker, the Minister has that authority. Clause 16 would amend section 50 by making the power of the Minister to make regulations under the section subject to section 49, which grants the Director General the power to make regulations. Madam Speaker, Clause 18 would amend section 52 of the power of the Minister to make regulations and making the power to provide the power to make regulations for offenses subject to the powers of the Director General under Section 49 and by adding to the matters for which the Minister may make regulations. The Minister, of, co of course, will be given the power to make regulations, exempting a person or a craft from application of the regulations made under the relevant section. Clause 19 of the amendment, Madam Speaker, would amend Section 53 by granting the Director General the power to make regulations for the mandatory or voluntary reporting of aviation occurrences. And Clause 20 would repeal Section 54, which now provides for exemptions by regulations. Clause 21 would repeal Section 55 of the Act, which now provides for exemptions in the public interest. And of course, Clause 22, Madam Speaker, would repeal the Civil Aviation Amendment Act number 16 of 2020. This act, this amendment is based on the mother bill drafted and circulated by the OECS the Commission in 2020 to assist member states in satisfying the requirements to move back to a category one status. The amendments from what I'm advised, Madam Speaker, were not implemented across member states. And the measures set out in the 2020 amendment will be superseded by the measures within this bill. So essentially, Madam Speaker, it's a pretty straightforward but very important amendment to the Civil Aviation Act, which essentially will remove a lot of the authority given to individual member states through their respective ministers of civil aviation. And Ma Madam Speaker, perhaps that was one of the challenges in which we had in, the, in terms of the regulation of civil aviation across member states over the, the years. 
whereby one member state may essentially be in compliance, having adhered to all of the necessary regulations and requirements of safety and oversight set by ICAO and the FAA, but then you may go to another state and they have not met the requirements. But if one member state is in compliance, but there are other member states who have fallen behind in the regulatory processes to ensure that we continue with the enhancements to our civil, civil aviation legislative regulatory framework and safety and oversight. It therefore means that all member states which fall under the ECHA will therefore not be in compliance. So what this bill does, Madam Speaker, is it gives a lot more teeth, a lot more legislative authority to the Director General of ECHA to ensure that when regulations are made, they are effectively triggered to be taken place across all member states. And of course, as we outlined, Madam Speaker, this is done in consultation with member states, with respective ministers of civil aviation. So there's consultation, there's communication before a decision is made um, without any form of discussion or knowledge of the ministers of civil aviation. But for all intents and purposes, it is to ensure that there's a stronger and efficient way of regulating our civil aviation or space in terms of applications um, for license, safety and oversight, our compliance with procedural and regulatory aspects that we must meet in terms of international standards. And we are essentially across member states harmoniously giving that authority to the Director General to ensure the effective functioning of civil aviation regulations. We're hoping, Madam Speaker, that in doing so, this is one step in moving towards back to category one. It's very easy to be audited. You may have a instance where one member state may not be in compliance, but you put the measures in place to facilitate getting the green light, so to speak, to, to, to remain compliant. And you move back to category one. But in very short order, a second audit would be done. And there are other shortcomings across member states which will also be triggered. And we move back from category one to category two again. So we're saying we're not rushing to move back to category one in a way which doesn't see us being fully compliant across the board. And we're talking about a whole sweep of widespread changes across both the legislative and regulatory framework, as well as the training and the facilitation of safety and oversight that we're doing. And some of the things, Madam Speaker, which we have, the steps we have taken over the last two years. IKO, IKO and ECHO, they have been working continuously to assist and provide training for staff within member states as well as at the ECHO. Here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have taken part in the IKO program for aviation volunteers for strengthening of the ECHO and the safety and security oversight systems of the Eastern Caribbean. We have received training on management compliance with ICAO SAP standards, ECHO's role in and responsibilities in the OSS International Aviation National Systems. This was done shortly after we were downgraded. We have had three, training three officers successfully completed diploma 
courses in aerodrome and approach control at Civil Aviation Training Center in Trinidad over the last two years. Three officers and two trainees have participated in training at the Civil Aviation Department. One officer successfully completed an IKO crisis management course. Three officers successfully completed supervisory, supervisory management training in, at the Civil Aviation uh, Training Center in Trinidad. One officer has participated in environmental sustainability for Civil Aviation Authorities training. Another officer participated in ICAO avi Aviation Restart to Aviation. Three more officers were trained and they participated in if ICAO Aviation Security Managers course. Training for young leaders in civil aviation development and pro promotion B courses for junior staff. And the department continues to work closely with, with ECHO to ensure safety and security standards are maintained and regular inspections and audits are conducted. Madam Speaker, presently we are updating manuals and developing additional manuals for areas in air traffic management and aeronautical information management. Two critical components to um, the training. And we're hoping that all of the required upgrade and development of our manuals should be completed in time for an IKEA audit, which is proposed for later this year, November 2023. In relation to member states which have so far passed this piece of legislation, St. Vincent, Grenada, and, and St. Kitts and Nevis, Madam Speaker, are forced out the blocks in terms of these legislative amendments. And we continue to work closely. All of the ministers, there is a committee of ministers of civil aviation. We work closely with ECHA and the OECS Commission to ensure we continue to put the necessary provisions in, provisions in place relative to safety, security, and oversight. Madam Speaker, I would save some further comments for the wrapping up of the bill, but I invite other persons who may wish to debate on these amendments. Further debates? Oh, further debates? Madam Speaker. Yes, <clears throat> recognize the Honorable Leader of the Office. Thank you. I don't, <laughs> I don't have very much to add. Suffice it to say <clears throat> this. Madam Speaker, I looked at the bill as it was presented to us in preparation for the debate in this Honorable House. And there are 22 clauses that are being amended. And basically it spans pretty much the act. It would be useful, or it would have been useful, had in the objects and reasons where it says what the bill is about. The Honorable Minister had said a bit more than just the most obvious, which is that this bill is intended to amend the Civil Aviation Act. Well, we know that. But the introductory remark that he made, that this is an OECS initiative, that it is intended to enhance, after I read through the amendments proposed, the safety regulation, or the regulation, the, the safety of civil aviation within the OECS, investigation of aviation incidents and so forth, how and by whom 
and what powers and what standards are applied, as I set out in the ICAO, well, in the regulations which refer to the ICAO. Madam Speaker, the objective of the legislation seems to be, from what the Honorable Minister said, to enhance safety and the overall administration of civil avi aviation in the OECS countries. And he's quite right, if one or two countries are fully compliant and others are not, then it affects the overall function of the regulation authority, but also the standards within the OECS as a region, it affects all of us. So every country basically has to move in tandem. And I suspect he would take some time, well, I urge him to in any event, for the benefit of listeners, not just to say that we're moving from category two back up to category one, but what does that mean for us as a civil aviation, um, as a space that is regula regulated by ECA? Anything, Madam Speaker, we know currently the difficulty that we have with civil aviation. Just this morning, I asked a question about night landing in Bekwe Airport at JF Mitchell Airport. And the Prime Minister made reference to ECA basically had indicated there were safety concerns that there are regulatory powers that are exercised by that institution that affects things like how hotels function, how they advertise, how they get their guests to come to a destination here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. If that is what affects whether there is night landing at the JF Mitchell Airport or not. So, Madam Speaker, it's a matter that while it may not be on the front burner for most of us, most of our people, what we are concerned about is the cost of air travel in the region, the availability of flights around the region, that you have to do this hopscotch to go to Miami to get to Jamaica and so forth. Those are things that most of the people who travel would be most um, come into contact with and would be particularly concerned about. But the context in which that occurs is one that requires regulation and upgrading and certain standards that meet international requirements. If, as the minister has indicated, that this bill helps us to get that done, then it is something that all members of this honorable house ought to support. And particularly, since what we do here is going to have some implication as well to what is done in St. Kitts or in Antigua or wherever else ECHA has jurisdiction, then it means that we have to hold up our end of it as well. But I, as a general comment about the way in which these legislation or these bills are brought to the parliament, I would urge that a bit more information is provided in the objects and reasons. I had raised this sometime earlier with another bill that was of OECS origin, and we were told that at least a fact, some sort of a cover sheet would be presented to help us to understand the context in which these amendments are being put forward, to help to guide the debate and to make us a part, Madam Speaker, truly a part of the, legisl the legislative process in this honorable house. I say that as well because there's another bill that this occurred to me when I was reading it last night. That is the Friendly Societies Bill, which comes before this honorable house. The Cooperative Societies Bill. That this bill also, it doesn't say much in the objects and reasons, but there are 
important amendments are being made there and a context in which we should interpret them would be useful. You know, I had some experience with drafting of legislation and the way the process through which legislation is put. When I was training to be a lawyer at the Department of Justice in Canada, and I know that they had, they used to provide that sort of information to the members of parliament, whether it's the lower house or the senate, that they felt there was an obligation so that those persons, no matter who you are, so long as you are a legislator, you have a context for understanding what your legislation is about. And I would urge that because we don't have select committees dealing with these things on a regular basis, that it would be useful to provide more. And there used to be a little bit more in the objects and reasons, not a lot. But to provide more so that it would be useful to this entire house to provide context for the debate that follows. But Madam Speaker, we also, of course, makes it much more difficult given the fact that we don't have easy access to the legislation as well. I was trying to get a copy of the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. I have a copy. But, you know, to get a hard copy, it wasn't the easiest of things. And similarly with a lot of the legislation here, we have the software and so forth, which is not user-friendly as those of us who have interacted with it know. But it makes it all the more important that the drafters of the legislation prepare for the benefit of the entire House some, a more fulsome explanation as to the objects and reasons of the bill rather than the most obvious one line that is intended to amend the bill. In any event, Madam Speaker, I have heard the representations of the Minister in this matter, I understand also that bills, when they are of OECS origin, we tend to seek to have harmonization amongst the OECS countries. And unless there is some particular strong reasons why we would object to it, Madam Speaker, as in this case, we would lend our support to the bill. And that's what we intend to do on this side of the House. Thank you. For the debate. I recognize the Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, this is a very important piece of legislation. And I think we should begin by providing a wide context in which we would lodge the important changes which are being made. The Minister of Civil Aviation moved this bill, did some of it, and I will seek to add. The first thing we have to remember, and, and listeners, people who are hearing this, and I'm sure honorable members know this, that civil aviation is one of the areas in which the governments of the OECS territories have decided to accord supra-national authority to a regional institution called the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. And there is an agreement which establishes that authority. And there are changes to that agreement. And there is an act with the Chapter 81, which addresses the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Agreement called the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Agreement Act. Madam Speaker, the 
second thing to note is that the Civil Aviation Authority, there was an agreement prior to it in relation to a civil aviation, a regional civil aviation department. It's not quite an authority evolved into that. It's headquartered in Antigua, and there is a headquarters agreement with the government of Antigua and Barbuda. And that government has certain responsibilities in relation to the headquarters and the condition of the headquarters. The Civil Aviation Authority gets its revenues from fees in relation to the licensing of pilots and planes and to check them on an ongoing basis and to give <coughs> air operating certificates without which you can't operate in the space. civil aviation space of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. And of course, there are shortfalls and therefore ECHA has to be provided with subventions. The individual states are party to the International Convention. The IKO, we are part of it, but we are recognized that we have come together to regulate our space for civil aviation. The FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, by itself does not have authority over us. But where the Civil Aviation Authority is important globally is the strength of civil aviation in the United States of America and globally. Number of persons don't know this, but Barbados, their civil aviation department, they don't have category one. They've, they've, never, they've not had category one. When we, had, when we had category one, they were still category two for a series of technical reasons. And you may say, well, how is it that the airlines so many airlines go from the United Kingdom and, and from um, America and Canada. Well, the point is, is those aircraft are not registered in Barbados. They're registered in the United States, in Canada, in Britain, in France, and they have their own national authorities which regulate their civil aviation space and the planes, the aircraft, which are registered under their jurisdiction, and the pilots, which are licensed under their jurisdiction. And the aerodromes, which are licensed under their jurisdiction. So that what American Airlines would be concerned about in relation to, say, Barbados or any country with a Category 2. Let's take St. Vincent and the Grenadines because it's part of ECHA. Is that your own airport, your own aerodrome is safe 
even though it's not category one, because it's not the aerodrome alone, but that the, the security arrangements also at your airports satisfy FAA because a permission would have to be given by American Airlines or any of those other airlines to go to a place, to any place. And in this case, say Barbados with Category 2 or St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So you ask the question, what does Category 1 matter? Well, it matters in two broad respects. One, if the FAA says it's Category 1, it means that they, they have audited you and every single aspect of it, including your headquarters and, and um, all your pilots and the registration of your planes and everything. Because they, when you have a category one status, you can then go to an American jurisdiction Thus, when we were a category one jurisdiction and there were some issues which arose which made the FAA say, no, well, you, you slipped in certain respects and you go on category two. All that did to Liat was to make it not possible for Liat to go to Puerto Rico or to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands. So it is important from the standpoint of an economic advantage for a particular airline registered in your, juris, in your category one jurisdiction. So the question which was asked, what does it matter? The planes which are registered in Barbados can't go to Puerto Rico, but a plane from Puerto Rico registered in the United States of America, can go to Barbados. Now, we, when we arrived in office, we were category two. And we did a lot of work. So Vincent Beach, a blessed memory was then Minister of Civil Aviation, and we put a lot of leadership behind the matter. And I was the lead prime minister on the issue of civil aviation. And we got everything going together in the Eastern Caribbean. And I actually went to Antigua and received the Category 1 certification from the FAA and from the U.S. Ambassador to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. I think there are photographs and reports of it all about. And if, you know, it would be in the internet somewhere, deep there. But times change. Security requisites change. And you have to be nimble and make all the changes on a timely basis. I'll show you something which can, which, which would, which would earn you um, low marks.
In one case, there's a government which named the chairman of their own national authority. So you have a, a seaport and airports authority. And you put that person as your representative on the board of ECA. Well, that's a conflict of interest because ECA is supposed to regulate that very entity. I'm, I'm going down now to nitty gritty. And I believe, I, I, I don't want to sound, I know more about this than other persons here, but I think because of my experience with this matter and the fact that I've also been, I was chairman of the board, the shareholders of LIAT for 20 years, and I've worked on the legislation and go, went through all the changes and given the role I was assigned. You study it, it's a, it's, a, it's a very detailed and complicated area. You have to know it inside out. There are experts in this particular field. Madam Speaker, the FAA was saying, how is it now that you have ministers making particular kinds of regulations? Well, under our system of laws, Madam Speaker, the technical people do their work, but they're issued under the hand of the minister. That's how it is in our jurisprudence. They say, no, 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 that can't happen. And a, a number of countries were saying, but I mean, it can't happen. This is our tradition. This is our legal system. And I kept saying to them from the very first moment that that arose, circumstances have changed. And the United States of America, the FAA, is saying, they want a technical person to sign on with these safety and oversight regulations, not a minister. This is why half of these amendments, honorable members, if you read them, is taking away the authority from the minister and giving it to the director of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. And this is a very important change. Of course, the minister has authority to make certain other kinds of regulations, but not those germane con con concerning the, the issues regarding safety and security standards. And the United States of America is also very influential in the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. I will tell you, Madam Speaker, I'll tell you how how influential they can be. In the aftermath of 9-11 and all that, the terrorist attacks in the United States, they came to a convention, they went to a convention in Montreal. And they said, well, in terms of safety and security and so forth, we, we need to have passports no longer issued for 10 years. It should be done for five years because people's configuration can change, their facial look and all the rest of it. There was a decision made. Vince and Vincent Grenadines were faithful. You remember, Madam Speaker, we introduced passport for five years? They went back to the United States and they changed their mind. And that particular decision was vacated. Of course, it would always be done under right reason. But Madam Speaker, <laughs> if it was right reason for five, why you change your mind so quickly? Anyway.
There are other areas. I mentioned the headquarters agreement. The government of Antigua admits that the facilities which they have as the headquarters are not fit for the purpose of the headquarters. And they have taken some time in having new headquarters. And I spoke to Prime Minister Brown, and he said they have identified a place um, to construct. ECHA has agreed, and that, that process is on its way. Madam Speaker, I don't know, you, you, you're getting the drifters to hold the, the whole set of matters which come into this issue. But the Category 2 status doesn't stop America from coming to you. What it will do is if the, if the rules are changed, you take, for instance, one of the problems with Air Canada. Because you have a flight coming down and the pilots, them who take that plane, have to take it going back up. Well, if you're making the turn around the same time and it's a, it's a fairly long, long journey, you need a time, a, 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 a long time period with the regulations, in the regulations. I hope that particular kind of context would help. And what, we ha what is happening essentially with this bill is that the bill will give effect to amendments made to the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Agreement to implement measures which have been approved to help us get back to category one. And so that we can comply with the ICAO safety and security standards in a way that FAA could assess what they reach for category one. But category two doesn't mean that your airport, the planes can't come into it. It's only if you don't have certain minimum standards there, Madam Speaker. You know that, let's, for instance, when the FAA comes, the FAA does an audit. The FAA doesn't have the authority to tell you, if you don't do this, this place closes. That's ECHA, you know. But when the FAA comes and they do an audit, it would be wise for you to listen carefully to whatever shortcomings there may be and make the correctives. As in fact, airports and jurisdictions in civil aviation across the world that they do. I believe that I'm making it real, Madam Speaker. The sections, the, 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 the amendments are not complicated, and uh, I don't want to go to them at this particular hour where the minister has dealt with several of them, and, and they're really self-evident, but I, I spoke to, I, I've spoken to a, a big one in relation to the authority of the minister being to make the regulations for safety and um, security standards to have that removed and replaced by the director of the Civil Aviation Authority, the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. And it is true that this is a regional piece of legislation, and we have gone through in detail through the regional drafts persons, the experts in the field, including, um, Madam Speaker, advisors who come from the FAO and I, the, the FAA and from ICAO. But we all have to make these changes, 
And as the Honorable Minister pointed out, some are making them faster than others. There are a set of regulations. This, this is the main bit of legislative work which is coming. The parts move and we may yet be here again another time. But the other kinds of legislative work uh, things which are of an administrative type, Madam Speaker, and matters dealing with training, the, the actual application of the rules themselves, the, uh, the regulations themselves, and there's substantial regulations which are here and some have been amended. And Madam Speaker, regulations, some of them which the cabinet had to, be sign, had to sign on to through the regulatory regime of the particular act, but not dealing with the issue of safety and security standards, where the, the legislative framework is now altered so that, Madam Speaker, the Director General of, the, of ECHA will then be able to make appropriate regulations following the legal authority being given. I'm very pleased that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition raised the issue as to availability of aircraft. You know, Madam Speaker is a little rich, if I say so. But this is an issue which has divided the government and the opposition in this country for years. The founding father of the NDP didn't have much faith in Liat and went for Caribbean Express, which didn't last as long as Miss Janie Fire, metaphorically. Where does it come in, Honorable Member for Central Kingston? It comes in because the Honorable Leader of the Opposition raised the the raise the issue of availability of planes and the hopscotching and the cost and it is my duty to address it and to provide what he requires a historical context and the no I'm not Christopher Columbus no I'm not Christopher Columbus I'm not it's only that it's only that I've been around a long time About what? About the cost and availability. Yes, but, but, but I'm, I'm, that's why I'm getting to it. That's why I'm getting, that's why I'm getting to it. You don't want to hear this. You may not want to hear it, but I will, I will speak it. And when I came to office in 2001 as Prime Minister, actually, actually, I hope, no, 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 it's not, no, if you're talking about Calypso, about Columbus, it's is, is, is Peter at the gate, it's is, is Stalin. Stalin sing the Calypso about Columbus at the gate and, and Victoria and so on and so forth. You, 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 know, you know what I mean? And, but the point is this, I have to speak the facts. It is absolutely necessary because the New Democratic Party opposition Opposed, I will raise my voice as I want or carry it down as I want. I will modulate it as much as I want, up or down. You know, if you don't, if you don't like it, you can shout, you can walk out, you can call me devil. And when I go out, not you would organize it. But there's a subterranean thing that if you walk, boss his head and you go get away. Yes, yes. I wasn't going there, you know. You, you, you taking me there, but I'm, I'm fine. I'm an ancient warrior, you know. I am an ancient warrior, and there are many them. I tell you, I looking for martyrdom. Uh, the runs, the runs, the runs I have on the tins. None of you will be able to knock them off, though. I could tell you that. 
the runs I have on the tin. Yeah, you can, you can leave. Uh, oh, you mean to say you can't take it? <laughs> you, can't, you can't take the lyrics, eh? Well, I tell you, until the Lord ready for me to take me, and as I, I hope into, I can't be sure, but one thing I know, one thing, one thing I know though, is that if you and others like you survive me, and I hope you come to my funeral, I'm not asking that you go before me, because ants will bring the news for me that you know Sinclair Likak is up there still cussing you. <laughs> Even when I'm dead. <laughs> you, you won't be able to help yourself. <laughs> you can't silent now because you know I hit the truth. Madam, Madam Speaker, Liat was falling apart when I arrived in office. Everybody was going for Stanford. Everybody was going for Stanford now. No, everybody was going for Stanford. And I took on Stanford. I became the chairman of the shareholders. We put, Liat would have gone under in January 2002 if we did not put in $2.9 million. We came here and voted it in the parliament. And say, if Liat didn't exist, we had to invent it. And we had to reform it. And up to April 2000. And 20, when we brought, you're going to hear me though. If you don't hear me, the people will hear me. The people hearing me that in April 2020, when I came here with a bill in relation to, you know, <laughs> Madam, Madam Speaker, the last time. The last, Madam Speaker, the last time when he called me the, the devil, the, the video went all about, and he gets so much thunder from his NDP people. They told him, they told him, why, why, why you behave like that so? They gave him so much thunder, they tell him when you come to the house next time, you must say you're sorry. That's, that's it. They say, they say, they say, they say you're going to come and sorry. Look at how your leader touching you and tell you behave yourself. Let us know your leader. <laughs> tell you. <laughs> I, you talk and you believe you wish. Talk and you believe you wish. Madam Speaker, how much time do I have remaining? Huh? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I'm obliged. I'm obliged. <laughs> have, a, have a good evening, Honorable Member for Central Kingston. Yes. No. <laughs> you mean to say I, I let the people in Sharps know that purely on the basis of lyrics, the comrade chased the major out of parliament. <laughs> no. I in twenty well not only the major I'm chasing. I see the Honorable Member for West Kingston also leaving. <laughs> well, you know, Madam Speaker, it look as, it look, it look as though the lyrics are, the, the whole bench might go just now. They didn't come and listen to me when I was winding up in the, in, in the, in the budget debate, so I'm not surprised. Yeah? And when it came here, when, it, when the ULP government came here in April 2020 for a, with the, the appropriation bill supplementary estimates for additional monies for COVID, a hundred and something million dollars, we had in that package, we see there's one thing inside of here, which is non-COVID, $2.7 million for LIAT. Because the discussions which were going on at the time, it was said that we, will, we should put in a million US. Barbados was supposed to put in some money, Antigua to put in some money, the main shareholders. We didn't, what was the position of the, the NDP opposition at the time? You're throwing money down the hole with Liat. It is, 
no use. Let the private sector take care of the, the airways, the, um, the skies. That's what you said. You even coined the thing. When you put money for Liat Aim, put in money where the pain is, put the money where the pain is. And now the leader of the opposition complaining about pain. But when Barbados said, because of certain issues which had developed, that they couldn't go along anymore with Liat, and when the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda said, well, you think both of us can carry it? I said, I don't think so. You know, you could give me Bamanko. That's what I told him, Madam Speaker, to use the local parlance. That's not a bad word. That's just a local word. People didn't feel the pressure during COVID because there wasn't a lot of traveling. As soon as the worst of COVID is over, I knew what was going to happen. I made a point throughout that air transport between these islands is a marginal financial proposition, but it is a public good in social and economic terms. And while we have to run it efficiently, as best as we could, we need to put money in it for social and economic purposes. They laugh me to scorn. Let the private sector do it. Well, where are all those who are talking about the private sector entities? I gave the experience how the private sector entities came and fell. Even those private sector entities where the state pumped money in them. Like, for instance, Carib Express. No, we have to rely on Inter-Caribbean, which hasn't lived up to its promise, is doing its best. We're seeing Cal is going to get four more ATR planes between now, between the end of March and October, which would lift the load. The, there are two planes out of three which Liat owned, which are operating now. They, from out of Antigua, they're operating that, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Barbados and say, look, take our shares for a dollar. But Madam Speaker, you know, we're still paying. Barbados and St. Vincent Grenadines and Antigua still play, paying for those three planes from at the Caribbean Development Bank. Fortunately, our money is relatively small because at the time of the refleeting, when they want us to go in equal shares, I said, no, we have to invoke the Aristotelian principle of equity among equals, proportionality among unequals. And in terms of service, we were unequal to Barbados and Antigua, but we're still paying there because we made a contract with the Caribbean Development Bank. We asked them to change it, they say no, because they know that it's better to let three countries be paying in their respective shares than just Antigua alone. Madam Speaker, we are now trying to get, we're working with the CDB as a consultancy, and we're having meetings to see what we can do in the short term and how we can restart, whether there's a liat or something else in the medium term. In the meantime, I have opened initial discussions with, the, with Air Delphi, they have just got, that is to say, the people from Mustique, the Mustique company, they own five twin, twin otters, 19 seaters. Very good planes, very safe. And they can help with the journey between, short journeys between here and Barbados, here and Grenada, here and Trinidad, here and St. Lucia. We should even take them up to Dominique and even up to Antigua. And if you need to have more space at the, for, for, for bags, 
You can take out 20 seats and have them as 17 seaters. It's easy to, to reconfigure them like that. So, um, they have five, which helps to take their workers and take their guests. I'm asking if they can buy another two, if we can um, work with them. And I'm hopeful next week that we'll have a discussion, Madam Speaker, with a particular technical person so that in the, even with some kind of a newly admixed Madam Speaker, if that comes about, and what is happening with Inter-Caribbean and what is happening with Cal, still would not give us what we had with Liat. For all the time they forget that we used to get 42 flights a week in and out of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And Rene Batiste had memorably told the opposition in the House one day when we were debating Liat, when they were opposing us getting the money from the parliament for Liat. She said, if you don't have Liat in the sky, we go half, in, in her memorable language, she, she said, we go half a tech, we belly make boat to go to Barbados. I didn't intend, Madam Speaker, to raise Liat. I didn't intend to raise, raise the air transport issue widely. I was going to stay to the brief in respect of civil aviation regulations. But the Honorable Leader of the Opposition opened the door. So what must I do? If he, if, if he throw me a lollipop, I'm at, I'm, at, I'm at the crease. What must I do? I must hit it anywhere out of the boundary for six because they are the ones who oppose Liat all the time. If they had given us support for Liat, we might have stand up a little better. But every day it was a chin music, as people say in the village. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with all that money for Liat? Wasting money. Repeatedly, they must acknowledge that they were wrong about it. Because they wanted, they were very enamored about Caribbean, Caribbean Star and Caribbean Sun, you know. They, they wanted to hug up Stanford. Look, Stanford, the money, you put wasting money, Stanford has these two airlines. I say, I don't want any American, even though he has become an Antiguan, to control the airspace. And there are more things I could say, but I've said enough, Madam Speaker. And the public know that on this vital issue of air transportation, the NDP got it wrong. And the Unity Labour Party got it right. Thank you very much. Further debate? Further debate? Further debate? Yes, I recognize the Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me thank members, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, for lending their voice and support to this piece of legislation, Madam Speaker. In concluding and drawing in the context of all that has been said, Madam Speaker, I just want to indicate to all members and those who are listening that the civil aviation, the legal mechanisms that exist both at a regional and international level are critical in regulating air transportation, both at an operational level in the air and administratively on the ground. Within member states of the ECA, we have there about 14 or so airports in which daily there are flights coming in and out of our airspace within the jurisdiction. We have to take into account measures relating to security and oversight. Operational aspects of airworthiness of these um, aircrafts. And a number of changes which continue to take place. In fact, even within this amendment, Madam Speaker, there's a 
provision for the inclusion, and perhaps the very first time we're looking at it, of health. And the, the reason why health is coming in, you'll, you'll, you're mentioning of safety, security, and oversight, but health within the context of aviation. And that also relates to a global health pandemic. What regulatory measures must be put in place? Persons boarding, deplaning aircrafts, going into different jurisdictions. Very recently, there were also annexes to the Chicago Convention relative to the environment and the environmental concerns as it relates to global warming and its impact within the aviation industry. These are, these are new dimensions to an ever-evolving international, regional and international regulatory and legal framework that governs how we operate within different jurisdictions as it relates to air transportation and administration within the civil aviation industry on the ground. I mentioned, Madam Speaker, of the over a dozen or so airports, five of them are within St. Vincent and the Grenadines. An international airport, the Argyle International Airport, a jet port in Canawan, Beckway, Union Island, and so on. Just to note, Madam Speaker, in 2016, we evaluated 60 or so aircrafts for operating permits for the issuance of, of license to operate. 60, that's in 2016. By 2021, we were evaluating 1,200 aircrafts. for the issuance of permits for operation, 1,200. It's an industry that is rapidly advancing. We have seen a number of new carriers, such as Air Delphi, run by the Musti Company, the expansion of Inter-Caribbean, the Southern Caribbean within our own airspace. Conviesa, recently from Caracas to St. Vincent. And very soon at the end of next month, from Havana to the Argyle International Airport, bringing persons, additional persons to this destination. Next month, we'll see daily flights coming out of Miami from American Airlines, the expansion of Caribbean Airlines as well within the interregional space. The Prime Minister alluded to it, adding four additional ATRs to their fleet. And we continue to see more airlines, both private and commercial, within the jurisdiction. We have signed on, Madam Speaker. <laughs> you ready to go home? <laughs> this is an important piece of legislation, I'll remember. We have signed on to the Eastern, through the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority to the Convention on International Civil Aviation. And I just want to point out, Madam Speaker, that the Chicago Convention, there are several annexes to that, about 19 or so, that relates to safety management, aerodromes, designs, and operations, aeronautical information service, 
Aircraft Accident and Incident Investigation, Security and Safety and Management, all of these annexes. When they are compiled, Madam Speaker, it goes to the very moving parts of the legal and regulatory framework of civil aviation. And Madam Speaker, this piece of legislation in which we are amending the Civil Aviation Act will also further enhance what we have in terms of the regulatory framework to strengthen both the regulations in which we currently have, but also existing and future legislations which the Director General will now be mandated to, under the Act, roll out within the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, I don't wish to add any more to the debate on this particular bill. And Madam Speaker, all members, I move that the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole, the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Clause two, that clause two stands part of the bill. Clause three, that clause three stands part of the bill. Clause four, that clause four stands part of the bill. Clause five, that clause five stands part of the bill. Clause six, that clause six stands part of the bill. Clause seven, that clause seven stands part of the bill. Clause eight, that clause eight stands part of the bill. Clause nine, that clause nine stands part of the bill. Clause 10, that clause 10 stands part of the bill. Clause 11, that clause 11 stands part of the bill. Clause 12, that clause 12 stands part of the bill. Clause 13, that clause 13 stands part of the bill. Clause 14, that clause 14 stands part of the bill. Clause 15, that clause 15 stands part of the bill. Clause 16, that clause 16 stands part of the bill. Clause 17, that clause 17 stands part of the bill. Clause 18, that clause 18 stands part of the bill. Clause 19, that clause 19 stands part of the bill. Clause 20, that clause 20 stands part of the bill. Clause 21, that clause 21 stands part of the bill. Clause 22, that clause 22 stands part of the bill. Clause 1, that clause 1 stands part of the bill. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I move that the committee rise, House resumes, and the presiding member report to the House. Honourable <laughs> member, members, the question is that the committee rise, the House resumes, and the pres presiding member report to the Honourable House. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honourable Members, I have the honour to report that a bill for an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77, has passed the committee stage without amendment. Honourable Minister. Honor, honor, Madam Speaker, Honourable Members, I move that the bill be read a third time by title and pass. Honourable Members, the question is that a bill for an act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Chapter 77, be read a third time by title and passed. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, Madam Clark. Civil Aviation Amendment Act, 2023. Item number five, Conrad Simon Pension Declaration Bill, 2023. Yes, Honorable Minister of Public Service. <laughs> Honorable Madam Speaker, I, I beg to move that a bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, Ministry of Agriculture, be read a first time. Honorable Members, the question is that a bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits 
to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, Ministry of Agriculture, be read a first time. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move understanding Order 48 to that this bill be taken through all stages at today's sitting. Second motion. Honorable members, the question is that this bill be taken through all stages at this sitting in accordance with standing order 48-2. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the bill for an act to provide for payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer in the Ministry of Agriculture, be read a second time. Second motion. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, Ministry of Agriculture, be read a second time. As many as have that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Debate on the bill, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Mr. Conrad Simon, an agricultural officer in the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry, and Labor, um, worked in the Ministry of Agriculture from the 17th of September 1984 and during the period the 15th of April 1998 to the 14th of April 2001 and the 3rd of June 2001 to the 31st of March 2003 he was seconded to work with the European Union under the Stabex irrigation project and so Madam Speaker this is one of those bills that we, we, we used to, to use this period to, for his pensionable purposes. So we, we just asking, Madam Speaker, that the period, the 15th of April 1998 to the 14th of April 2001 and the 3rd of June 2001 to the 31st of March 2003 be considered for his pension, to improve his, his pension, Madam Speaker. I'm much obliged. For the debate. Honorable Leader. Yeah, Madam Speaker, no debate. Just to say that I wish him a happy retirement. I know he still has a lot more to give. So, next phase to go. Um, Madam Speaker, we go through this over and over again, and um, I suspect at some point we may have a way to resolve it without these things coming to Parliament because I know sometimes it delays people getting their pension and all of that. But I wish Conrad Simon all the best in his retirement. Thanks. For the debate, Honorable Minister. For the <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'd like to, to thank the, the leader of the opposition for his, up, his, inter, his, his kind words. And I too would love to see Mr. Simon get his pension, improved pension for the period that he was seconded to work with the European Union. And so, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Second motion. Clause 2, that clause 2 stands part of the bill. Clause 2 as amended, that clause 2 as amended stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1, that clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Madam Chair, I beg to ask that the committee rise and the presiding officer report to this honorable house. Second. Honorable, me mm -hmm. 
Honorable members, the question is that the committee rise, the House resumes, and the presiding member reports to the Honorable House. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable members, I have the honor to report that a bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, Ministry of Agriculture, has passed the committee stage with one amendment. Honorable Minister. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, the Ministry of Agriculture, be read a third time by title and passed. Honorable members, the question is that a bill for an act to provide for the payment of retirement benefits to Conrad Simon, Agricultural Officer, Ministry of Agriculture, be read a third time by title and passed. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Conrad Simon, Pension Declaration Act 2023, adjournment. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, well, we have two bills on the order paper. To, we're traversing them to the 13th. Yes. That's the date, 13th of, of March. Um, and they would. I, I suspect other bits of legislation. The, I am hopeful, I can't say with certainty, that the 13th probably could be the last time that we will sit in this honorable house in its current condition. For those who are responsible for the temporary parliament out in Kaliakwa, I've been advised that sometime, certainly by the 13th, it should be, all works should be finished, um, and all the systems should be okay, and I'm hoping that the furniture would, would, would um, arrive to go in. Um, and, and, and that, before the end of March, we may be able to have a sitting there, hopefully. But I'm, I'm hoping that this will not be, that this will, the 13th will probably be the, 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 the last occasion here. Probably, but I'm, I just say that to alert us as to the, the possibility. I'm not saying it with certainty. Um, because we need to get this facility fixed up. Um, and we need to move over. The court has to move over to uh, to the to the building, the the, the National Commercial Bank at, at Bedford Street. The, st the the government is purchasing it from um, the bankers in Vincent Grandins. We are finalising discussions as to the, the the number, and then. Not too long after that, I'm hoping we can begin the construction up at um, Morris Road, Richmond Hill, of, the, of the, the, the modern parliament, and also to start in pretty short order thereafter the courthouse, the court complex. So it's a lot of things are tied up in what we are doing, Madam Speaker, but we have a plan in going forward. I. I've been advised, Madam Speaker, by two of my colleagues. I, I, don't, I don't have my phone with me so that um, the Deputy Prime Minister didn't send me a text message, but he had sent to other colleagues that um, he, he went to the Georgetown Health Medical, the, the Modern Medical Diagnostic Center. Um, and he's been transferred. I don't know if he's 
the transfer is complete yet to Milton Cato Memorial. I don't know if there's been a any other challenge arising with his with his leg. Well, I'm hoping that everything is okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'll pass to see him, but I just think that I should inform colleagues that um, that's the information which has come which has come to us. Um, he's a very strong man. I don't know what what the particular ailment is at the, at, at the um the leg. Because I know that's just what he was complaining about yesterday. I beg to move that this honorable house do stand adjourned to Monday, March the 13th, 2023 at 10 a.m. Honorable members, the question is, that this house do stand adjourned until Monday, 13th March, 2023, at 10 a.m. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. The ayes have it. House stands adjourned.